All right, there's a little extra music there. Well, good morning. Merry Christmas. Come on, look at somebody around you. Tell them Merry Christmas. And can, can we just thank our team and uh, all the behind the scenes and what we see up here, all that goes into making Christmas at LifeGate so special. Thank you, guys. So special. We have, a, we have a lot of talent here, a lot of gifts that are being used to, to glorify the Lord. And, uh, man, I'm so excited. Uh, the, the Christmas, or sorry, the, the Christmas before the Christmas. The weekend, the Sunday before Christmas is always so special uh, at LifeGate. I'm still a, a mess and uh, just overwhelmed at the goodness of God. I'm overwhelmed that there is no other name but the name of Jesus, that he is our source, that he is everything we need. And what a way to end a year uh, it's just an exclamation point over this year and all that is to come that God is good, that he is able, and he is our source. And there is no other name but the name of Jesus. Well, before we get into the message today, I want to tell you about something exciting coming in January. Everybody say one thing. I want to read a verse to you. Psalm 27, 4. It says, I ask only one thing of the Lord. Say one thing. Let me live in your house every day of my life to see how wonderful you are, and to pray in your temple. And one thing is coming in January, January 4th to the 8th. It's going to be our time of prayer and fasting corporately as a church and just seeking the Lord. And we're going to do exactly what this verse is. You say, what's the vision, what's the heart behind our time of prayer and fasting? This, one thing. Say one thing. One thing. You know what I'm doing right here. Keep you, help you, help you remember it. We're going to do one thing. We're going to seek the Lord in his house. And how many of you want God's best for your family and for our city and for our, uh, everything that he has for us in 2021. And we, we've learned this principle of, of putting God first, setting aside a time of prayer and fasting. Uh, we've done it a lot of years, and it's, just, it's really special what the Lord does in, in that time. And so I want to encourage you, participate. There's a, a, a way that you can text up on the screen. You can text one thing to that number, and uh, we're going to provide you prayer points and direction every day. And then the chapel uh, right across the, the street, right across the intersection there, is going to be open uh, 7 to 7, right? Is that 7 to 7, 12 hours open? You just come in, drop in. If you can be there five minutes, you can be there five hours. Uh, we're going to be there praying, and uh, we're going to have a good time seeking the Lord together. So you'll come in. Prayer points will be there. Worship will be kicking, and uh, we're just going to seek the face of God together as a church. We're going to believe for his best in 2021. And, uh, and I, I want to encourage you, uh, fasting and prayer. There's something powerful when we couple fasting and prayer together. And, uh, and so there's lots of resources there. Once you, uh, on, the, on our website, you can check out all the different ways that you can participate. But the important thing is that we hear from God and we participate together. All right, one last time, one thing. That's what we're going to do. We're going to seek the face of the Lord. So uh, we're going to get in. I'm going to finish last week's, uh, got into half of it last week about the name of God. We've been looking in Isaiah and seeing, and unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the announcement of Jesus 700 years before, before Jesus ever came, before this manger ever happened, God foretold, he let, he let the people know, hey, I'm coming. And, and he declared through Isaiah, this prophet, the names of Jesus. And, and not that we would change the name of Jesus, but that we would see the characteristics, the things that our Jesus was to accomplish. And, and it came in a time of great darkness. It came in a time where the nation was, was divided and uh, King Ahaz was not a godly king and he was leading uh, the, the, uh, the people of Israel in the wrong direction. Israel was in disobedience, but... Isaiah is this breath of fresh air, also a, a challenge, an admonishment from the Lord to challenge the people of God, to look to God, to look to a king that is greater. And the king that he begins to describe in Isaiah 9 is our king. And I want to pick up uh, where, we, where we left off last week and pick up and see right here where his declaration is of the name of Jesus. And this is Handel's Messiah. I'm going to sing it for you. You ready? Start the music back there. We're going we're gonna, to, no, I'm not. I, you're welcome. I'm gonna, Amy, I, I, I really wanted to, and Amy said, Michael, that's probably not a good idea. You probably shouldn't do that. But here, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders. Now listen, a lot of times that, that scripture has been declared when we don't like the government. Like when, when we think about the government, you know, 
here, or we think about even, even the government in the past. We've seen it in, the, in other countries and other nations where that authority has been abused or not used in the right way. And, 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 and nothing wrong with praying, yes, the government is on his shoulders. He's ultimately in charge. But there's a greater thing that, that Isaiah is trying to help them understand. Here it is very simply. Anybody ever just need it simple? Like, what? Just, just break it down for me. So I'm going to break it down. He's saying you're carrying something that you weren't designed to carry. And this king I'm about to announce can carry a burden and carry a weight that, you were, that you've been trying to carry on your own. Well, what is that weight? That, that weight is sin. That weight is sickness. That weight is, is temporary and, and momentary uh, pain, but also eternal pain where we were separated from God. It was the small picture, it was the big picture, it was the micro, it was the thing that's right in front of us that seems to weigh us down, but it was also the eternal judgment and the, and the separation from God. And, and so he is speaking to the small thing, to the, to the thing that's right in front of them, but he's also speaking to the big picture. Before I read the rest of this, uh, always, it's, it's interesting, we have this, um, this, uh, uh, tradition that we we do almost every year and we go as a family to see the lights at Callaway Gardens and sometimes we go uh, at Christmas time and I always think about this uh, around Christmas time and and so we we sometimes go a little bit early and uh, our family likes to ride bikes and at this time before I was converted to being a bike rider I, I didn't really like riding bikes and so everybody else would wear their clothes to ride bikes athletic stuff well I would dress like this I would wear blue jeans and you know a leather jacket and and they would all look at me funny like what what you know we're going to Callaway Gardens to ride bikes then we're going to see Christmas lights and I'm like yeah but I look good and I feel good so I'm you know and I mean you you know you got to pump yourself up you know sometimes and I I was just like well this is this is what I want to wear and Amy's like are you really sure and I'm like yeah I'm going to ride bikes in this I'm going to be fine and and it's going to be great. And Emma was just just a little girl. And, and uh, so I rented one of those bikes with the seat on the back of it where, uh, don't say all yet, just wait. <laughs> and, and so I'm holding the bike steady. We load Emma up on the back. And the only thing is Emma, Emma gets Emma's height. I mean, uh, Amy's height. She's, she's tall and long legs. And, 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 man, she's stretched out. And her feet just just stretched over the tires on the back. So she's sitting in the seat, but, but it's like having brakes stuck to the tires on the, on the back the whole way. And, and so the rest of the family kicks off, and they're gone. And I, I mean, I can't even see them anymore. And I, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. Emma, are you ready? Let's go, Daddy. we got to catch up with them. Let's go. Where are we, you know, let's go. And I'm like, okay, I got it, Emma. Let's go. And so I push off, and I'm like, I mean, I am pushing I mean, I threw a few strides into it, beads of sweat, I'm coming down, and then I'm thinking, I'm hearing Amy, like flashbacks of, are you sure you want to wear that? To, and I'm like, yes, I'm fine. And so, and, and, and Emma's tapping me on the back, you know, she's old enough to communicate, hey, let's go, let's, where, what's happening? The whole way, I'm smelling burnt rubber because her feet are dragging the back of the tire. I, I, I am obviously carrying a load that I was not equipped to carry and so and 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 it gets even worse we get halfway down I don't know if you've been to the trails in Callaway Gardens but they're not all flat it's up and down and all around and and I eventually I think we're catching up with them but it's winter time all the leaves are down and I we see through the woods the family and they're oh we're just having a great time and I'm like <laughs> and Emma's like you having a good time dad and I'm like yes Emma praise the Lord jingle bells jingle bells jingle all the way and I mean I'm, I'm just trying to enjoy this rubbers burning from her shoes and then she begins to ask why are we not where why are we not farther along why are we not with oh there's Bapa there's Bapa that's that's uh Tony my father-in-law there's Bapa I see Bapa Emma I see yes I see him up there I'm afraid so then Bapa in his Bapa way and loving kindness, and he's actually here today, and so it's kind of nice that this story is being told in honor of him too. But, but he, he comes around to see how we're doing. Well, I'm not really in the mood to be asked how I'm doing. You ever sweat through your leather jacket? I mean, I've probably got blisters by this time. Emma's trying to have a great time with the family. I don't even care anymore. I'm done. I'm ready to go back to that. You know, so anyway, we're, we're pushing along. Well, Tony just comes around. Hey, Michael, would you like some help? Well, do you, you want me to take Emma? She can, she can jump on the mic. We can trade bikes. And then, I mean, that's just, it's like throwing fuel on the fire. 
and I have a great relationship with my father-in-law, but don't you dare take my daughter off the bike that I am trying. This is my load to carry. She is my daughter. Her last name is Adams, not Ashmore. Like, I'm thinking all these things, and I, I am getting all fired up because it is my destiny to carry. Like, now it's, it's, it's personal. And I don't know what, I hope I didn't say anything, you know. I just, but, but, but then he just kept circling around. He just kept saying, oh, la, 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 la. Michael, you need some help. And then Emma jump, jumps in. Daddy, I could just jump on with Bapa. No, you can't. You're riding with me. We are doing this. We're, and, sh- and I never gave up. I, I, didn't, I didn't let go. It was my burden to carry. It was my weight. And I know you're going, oh, your daughter's a burden. Listen, she had become a burden in that sense. It was... If you had smelt the burnt rubber, like now, I still smell it, like it's coming back. It's just a great Christmas memory. It's wonderful, and I, I wanted to share it with you today. But, but I wonder how many times we're carrying something, and we have so set it in our minds that it's ours to carry. Sometimes we think we deserve it. Sometimes we think that, that, that well, I, I earned that. Well, I, I, you know, I picked this up in my life. It was my choice, and it was my, and I, and I get that. All that's true. But Jesus' announcement 700 years before his birth, and then the angels declare it when he is born, is that the government will rest on his shoulders. And whatever you're carrying today, whether you picked it up, whether you feel equipped to handle it or not, you have a good heavenly father that is riding around on a bicycle and going, ding, 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 ding. You need some help? You need some help? Because there were so many times in that journey, I just, wanted to, I just wanted to give up. I just wanted to walk. I just wanted to stop. And, and all along, there was this help. The truth of the matter is, I wasn't equipped to carry what I was trying to carry. And God never puts something on your life that he hasn't equipped you to handle and carry. The problem is when the, the, this word government is when we get in a lane that we weren't designed to live in. When we get in, when we try to take control of something and, and when really it's, it's God's. And I, I mean, I hear this multiple times during, during the years. The Lord goes, Michael, you're in my lane. Oh, yes, sir. I'm, I'm in your lane. And the Holy Spirit, his presence inside of us, this is this beautiful promise. Uh, Amy's car has this thing that, I didn't even know this was uh, possible, that like they had this, but it's a lane correction thing. So if you, if you begin to uh, veer or v- drift off into the other lane, all of a sudden the car does stuff. Like it lets you know, well, man, what, what a great gift that the Holy Spirit lets us know. When you're trying to get in charge, when you're trying to carry a weight that you weren't designed, the Holy Spirit is there to remind us, hey, Here's the name of Jesus. The government, look, the government will rest on his shoulders. And he carries a burden so that you and I don't have to. Both here, but eternal. This is a king that will reign forever. Now, let's pick up where Isaiah says, he says, the government will rest on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. His government and his peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of his ancestors, David, for all of eternity. The passionate commitment of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. So Isaiah tells us about a king that will rule, and he is wonderful counselor. The wonderful counselor tells us that that he is qualified to rule and reign. And And I just want you to remember from last week, he is comparing. This is in contrast to the king, the wicked king that they have at the time. But it's also in contrast. This is an eternal message. It's also in contrast to the things that try to rule in our lives. Even sometimes us, where we try to be in charge. Wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. So what? What does this mean? Does it mean that he's my therapist? Does it mean that he's my psychiatrist? Does it mean that he's my counselor in the sense of, uh, you know, I I think about counselor when it comes to Lord of the Rings. I mean, not Lord of the Rings, but um, Star Wars, you know, the the counselor and the, the, you know, a lot of different things come to our mind when we think of counselor. But it simply means this. It means the wonder of a counselor. It means means the wisdom of. And the know-how, not just the knowledge of what to do, but the, but the wisdom, the applied knowledge of how you do it. He is our source of direction. 
wow, this king is our source of direction. See, whoever you're listening to is going to determine the direction that you go every single time. You can, you can be a Christian and a believer and love God and serve God, but if you're listening to the wrong voice, you'll still end up in a place that you don't want to be. This listening, this, this wisdom, and, and, and he, he isn't just, just a source of wisdom in the sense that he gives you good, well, hey, I just want to give you some advice. No, he is the advice. He's not a advisor. He is the chief advisor. There is no other name. That's what that song means. When we're declaring that, it sounds good, especially the drum beat, and come on, there's, I mean, all that stuff just flows together, and it's like, yeah, there's no other name. But what does that practically mean in our life? It means that, that I don't try every other source for direction, and then when nothing else uh, works, then I come to him. He's not my last stop. He's my first stop. And get this, he's qualified. I don't know what kind of vetting process happened in heaven, but he, he met all the qualifications. He is a king that will reign forever, and he comes and he counsels with wisdom and love, and he comes in directions and, and will direct our steps. Look at what the psalmist says about the one who gives us directions. He says, I hear, this is Psalm 32, 8 through 9. He says, I hear the Lord saying, I will stay close to you, instructing and guiding you along the pathway for your life. I will advise you along the way and lead you forth with my eyes as your guide. Come on, that's good. It says, so don't make it difficult. Don't be stubborn when I take you where you haven't been before. Don't make me tug you and pull you along. Man, I'm having flashbacks to riding the bike in Callaway Gardens. Don't, don't make it difficult. And I, I read that this week, and I was like, I was like, Lord, I, I wonder how many times I make it. And you know, and you understand it's not difficult for him. He, he has no limit. There is no limit to his strength. But, but I think sometimes the tug of war that happens, he, he stays the same, but we tug of war all around him. You know, it's like, it's, like, it's like we're struggling. We're struggling riding the bike. We're struggling dragging our load. We're struggling, struggling just trying to, to get through. And he's, he, he is right. Hey, I'll help you. Hey, I'm right here. I'll show you. It says, I'll show you the direction to take. Stop struggling. Stop squirming. Relax. Rest in my wisdom. Well, I don't know how. Well, I don't know. That's okay. He does. Well, I don't know the direction. He knows the direction. And here's what's so wonderful about, I, I appreciate and love the confidence and the faith that we, we can have in the Lord that says no matter what, we trust God. But this, this, this um, characteristic of his name, why was he called wonderful? It wasn't just wonderful knowledge. It was wonderful counselor. A counselor is one who comes with the knowledge so that you know the direction to take. So I, I, I appreciate there are times, and I understand there are times that we just have to go, I don't know what to do, I'm just going to trust the Lord. But we don't just have to live in a place where we are oblivious to what direction to take. The very name Wonderful Counselor means that he wants you to be on the same page as he is. That he will come in such a way and tell you what choice to take. He'll tell you where you lost your keys. He'll tell you where, you where you need to change the direction with your kids. He'll tell you what needs to happen in your life to orchestrate it according to what? Because a lot of times it's this whole mystery of, well, where is God? And I just need God to speak to me. But the power of the living word, when we open the pages of the Bible, he, the wonderful counselor walks off the pages and we can know his heart, his intent, and what we should do based on what he has said in his word. Every single time. And here's the question I think we just have to ask ourselves, is the word enough? Is that enough? Or do we need something to happen in the sky? Do we need something to happen? Uh, what we, do you understand how miraculous in itself the, the very scripture is and the word is? 
And when we begin to treat it like that and put our confidence in it, that's all of a sudden we've, we have released and tapped into the wonderful counselor where now the wonderful counselor walks off the pages. It is not just a history book. It is a, it is a book for today. Isaiah's word of prophecy, you understand, this was the word. This was what he was declaring. It was alive that day. It was alive. It's alive now, and it will be alive forever. There is wisdom available to us where you're at right now. But when you go into the next season of life, guess what? There will be real practical wisdom from the word of God. Why do you think there's such a strategy of the enemy to cause the word of God to, be no, to, to, to not be absolute truth? Why would there be such a, such a challenge to, to the scripture, challenge to having, having a, the, the, the way of God or walking in the ways of God? Why would there be such a challenge to that? Because there is so much power for your life in it. The wonderful counselor, he comes with such wisdom. But not just to tell you, I love what the psalmist says, he's right there to walk with you in it. The New Living Translation says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. Anybody need that today? I do. I want to invite the wonderful counselor. Come, have your way. Would you let me use your eyes? Can I see the way you see things? The next thing that Isaiah says, he says that he is the mighty God. The mighty God. He is our source of strength. He is the mighty God. Ephesians 1 19 through 21, Paul, this is part of Paul's prayer. He opens up the, the, the book of Ephesians to the church and he begins to say, hey, this is what I'm praying for you. And this is what we can expect to experience from a mighty God. He says, I pray that you will continually experience the immeasurable greatness of God's power made available to you through faith. Then your lives will be an advertisement of his immense power as it works through you. This is the mighty power that was released when God when God raised Christ from the dead and exalted him to the place of highest honor and supreme authority in heavenly realm. Now, I just, I want you to, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I don't want you to miss what he's saying. He's saying when Jesus came, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and declared it is finished, declared the rule and reign that Isaiah is prophesying, this is what it means for you. So he's not just the mighty God distance from you. It wasn't just something that God does for you. It's something that the mighty God is present and does inside of you. You see that? There's, there's a lot more to it. It's not just something, well, yeah, because I think sometimes we can distance ourselves from it and say, of course, he is mighty. He, he does things over there. But aren't you glad <laughs> he just doesn't do mighty things over there? He does mighty things right here. Anybody in the room here because a mighty God did something <laughs> mighty and amazing in your life. It wasn't just something over there, it was something right here. And it was made possible simply by believing and trusting that he will do it. And all this authority comes together in heaven and on earth and it comes together for us. Verse 21, it says, now he is exalted as first above every ruler, authority, government, and realm of power in existence. He is the glorious enthroned he is gloriously enthroned over every name there is no other name I know it doesn't sound good but there's no other name I, I, he's gloriously enthroned over every name that is ever praised not only in this age but in the age to come and when they were heard hearing this mighty I mean, that's what you want to hear when you're being oppressed, when you're carrying a weight, when you're carrying a burden. I mean, that was good news to the people that Isaiah, in Isaiah's day. Hey, there is a mighty deliverer. There is a, there is a mighty warrior coming. It's actually why Jesus was born on the hit list. Herod was ready to kill him because Joel prophesied that he will come and there, there will be a, a he, basically, there is no other name but the name of Jesus. That he will come with authority and he will rule and he will reign. Well, that threatened all other authorities that threatened earthly authorities. And, and the people weren't thinking about an eternal reign. They weren't thinking about us 700 years later. They weren't, they weren't thinking about freedom when it comes to mighty God bringing deliverance and bringing freedom for eternity. They were just thinking about what was right in front of them. And I just really quickly want to remind you of, of, of what we talked about last week is don't get your eyes 
so caught up on the eternal, or excuse me, on the temporary that you don't understand the greater miracle of eternity. His kingdom will never end. This life, our breathing, the dash between when we were born and when we go on to heaven, the dash in between is just a blip on the radar. Now, can God do amazing things through it? Can we fulfill our purpose here on earth? Yes, it's, it's significant, it's impactful, but it's just simply, and it's so hard for us to think with an eternal mindset in, in, in this way. But he wasn't, he wasn't just a mighty God that was coming to deliver them from what they were currently struggling with. He was a God whose power extended beyond just the temporary into the eternal. Your eternal salvation is secure because you serve a mighty, mighty God. And then when it comes to right now what we're dealing with, whether it's sickness or disease or financial challenges or relationship struggles, we have the wonderful counselor who is also the mighty God who will come with power and strength, not just from a distance, but that you and I can experience in such a real way. Amen. Then he goes on and I mean, it gets... It just builds on each other, all these characteristics of the name of God. And it says, everlasting Father, Colossians 1, 15, and then verses 21 through 23, Paul speaks about this, this facet of God being an everlasting Father. And, and here's, here's what we have to understand, because there's some discrepancy sometimes in this. They go, okay, what happened to if, if we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, how is Jesus the Father? And what... what uh, what Isaiah is describing, he's not saying that Jesus is the father. He's not mixing that up. He's saying that Jesus loves us in the way that a father, a good father loves us. He meets us in a way with loving kindness in the way that Jesus actually described it. He says, when you see me, you see the father. I am a representation. I am a clear representation of who the, oh, who the father really is. Because remember, they were all saying, what's God look like? Or we want to know God. And he goes, look at me. When you see me, you see the Father. And so Isaiah describes this characteristic with the name Everlasting Father. And then Paul says he is the divine. He's talking about Jesus. He, Jesus, is the divine portrait, the true likeness of the invisible God and the firstborn heir of all creation. Verse 21, even though you were once distant from him, living in the shadows of your evil thoughts and actions, he reconnected you back to himself. He released his supernatural peace to you through the sacrifice of his own body as a sin payment on behalf, on your behalf, so that you would dwell in his presence. Man, that's a good father. And now there is nothing between you and Father God, for he sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. If indeed you continue to advance in faith, assured of a firm foundation to grow upon, never be shaken from the hope of the gospel. What, what is the hope of the gospel? Everything that he just said. That is our hope. That, that it, it is our, it, it is God, the, it, it is Jesus as, as the Father's representative, the everlasting Father helps us understand that he is our source of love. He is that source, this, this closeness, this, uh, and you know, with love, that, that's just, no, well, he just pats me on the back. No, sometimes he disciplines you. A good father comes and, and disciplines you, sets you right, challenges you, admonishes you. It says, never be shaken from the hope of the gospel you have believed in. And this is the glorious news that I preach all over the world. There was a church sign that I saw one time. It said on the sign, we care for you. And then right underneath it, it was Sunday, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. We care for you. 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Other than that. And I think sometimes our understanding of, of God being an, this kind of father, an everlasting father, is one that only cares for us or is close to us in certain moments or certain times. Amy was asking me about this. She goes, Do, are there certain times that you feel that you feel or you feel like, like seasons of your life that you feel like you hear God more clearly or, or times that you feel closer to him. And, and I said, yeah, I think, I think there are times like that. But I think this shows us that it's, 
the scripture and what the promise is of him being an everlasting father, that's not as much on God and the way he treats us as it is our attention on who he is. And I was thinking about for 2021, I, I want to be more in tuned and more sensitive. I, I, want, to, I want there to be greater, in season, greater seasons of, of, of hearing clearly and know, just intentionality and knowing that, man, I, I know God is close, but, but I want to experience him in such a real way. Like I, I want Sunday to build on, not just Sunday to build on Sunday, but I want Sunday to build on Monday. I want the reality of the, the closeness of who, who he is. And, and, this, and, and, and it speaks to him being an everlasting father. That's, that's the kind of father he is. That closeness and that experience that we can, we can experience in him uh, is possible and promised through Jesus. Colossians 1 in the New Living Translation, I love it. It says that now you're friends with God. Just imagine that. And especially for, for these these people listening to that and hearing that, what they had, had seen of God and what they had known of God wasn't what you and I know from the New Testament and seeing how it's, how it's lived out, having the Holy Spirit living inside of us. But you have the wonderful counselor and the mighty God and the everlasting Father right here. Right here. To live out, to walk out this life with. And in contrast to a king whose reign will die, Ahaz, there would be a season, there would be another king that would come. But with this king, his kingdom will never end. He is a father who will never leave us nor forsake us. He is a father whose kingdom will never, right? It's, it's not limited to a lifetime. It's eternity. And then finally, he says, Prince of Peace. He is the prince of peace. Simply, this king is our source of peace. John 14, 27, Jesus declares this about himself. He says, I leave you the gift of peace, my peace. Not the kind of fragile peace given by the world, but my perfect peace. Don't yield to fear or be troubled in your hearts. Instead, be courageous. Be courageous. This isn't a, a fragile peace like the world gives you. I was thinking about that, that sometimes we think that a lack of turmoil in our life means that we have peace or means that, that, that everything's okay. I'm not going to ask you if you've ever said this. I, I know I have actually said this, but, but we think when we get to a place in a situation where there is turmoil, that when we say, well, I, I've got, I, I feel peace about it, so I, I think everything's good. I feel a sense of peace. Sometimes it's not peace we're experiencing, it's distance from the truth that God's trying to reveal to us. The farther we get away from what God has been trying to tell us, the more faint the power, or, or the more faint the, the truth, what he's trying to reveal. And we, we, we think it's a sense of peace because, well, we've just figured it out and we've just, basically we've rationalized and justified enough to, to create our own sense of peace. And, and Jesus is addressing this. He goes, guys, I, I didn't come to give you some fragile peace like the world says. I didn't, give you, I, I didn't come to just give you a, a fragile peace that when everything is okay on the outside that you would still be in turmoil on the inside. I came to give you a peace. I came to give you my peace. H how many of you know that, that, that believe this, just, just with everything that you are, that Jesus is at peace today? God's peaceful. He is full of peace. He is peace himself. And I love this. Jesus didn't say, peace, y'all. It wasn't his sign off. It wasn't his, and actually where we even get that is from the principle of what Jesus was saying, is that when Jewish people would greet each other, and they still do this, when they greet each other or when they leave, they, it's shalom. What, what Jesus was saying is my wholeness is your wholeness. My completeness is your completeness. And sometimes in our life, I, I was learning this, I'm, uh, me and a, a couple of the guys on staff are going through uh, just a, a powerful book, and it breaks down the shepherd's call and how God is our good shepherd, but then how we're to lead people. And he talks about a good shepherd leads the sheep near still waters. And he, he takes that scripture and he takes what David is saying there and he begins to show us that, 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 that actually in, in real 
sheepology or in, in real husbandry when it comes to taking care of sheep, sheep would always get afraid and scared during rushing waters. But they had to have something to drink. Like they were thirsty. So, but, but they would get near the, 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 the streams or they would get near the rushing water and it would, the noise would, would freak them out. They, they weren't at peace. And it says, but the good shepherd leads them to still waters. And ultimately, it's a great principle in how we're to lead other people. But I was thinking about the good shepherd. I was thinking about the prince of peace and how he leads us to still waters. And it's not always where we want to go, but he leads us to where we need to go. And sometimes I, it's that, you imagine the bit in your mouth and just pulling. And he's like, uh-uh, come on, we're going this way. Come on, we're going, I'm, I'm going to lead you to still waters. He is our source of peace. And that word prince there, the word prince is administrator. He's the administrator of the peace that you need. He gets you. He gets what you don't get. And he knows what you need. And so today there may be some turmoil. There may be some things inside of you. And it's not because you're not hearing from God. It's because you are hearing from God. It's because he's leading you to a place that you need to go or you need to be, or he's telling you what you need to hear. And you know what? We got to quit pulling and we got to stop and we got to recognize that he's the administrator of our peace, that he's an everlasting father, that he comes because he knows exactly what we need. And he's that good king or that good father-in-law on the bike. Ding, 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 ding. Hey, you need some help? No. got peace for you today. I'm the administrator of your peace. Not some fragile peace that that won't hold up. Not some fragile peace that's going to get you through the next season or the next time or through this thing. This peace is an everlasting peace. This is a wholeness. This isn't just peace of mind. This is the wholeness of your heart. It's complete. It's not just what's needed in the moment, but what's needed for eternity. I want you to think about the reality that we, because of Jesus, we have peace with God today. I don't deserve that, and you don't deserve that. But because of Jesus, we get it. And I have walked in my own advice so many times and taken, anybody take your own advice? Especially when you've been there before. Yeah, yeah, I did this with my dad the other day. We went off and... I didn't use the GPS. And I said, Dad, I, I know exactly where we're going. I've been there a hundred times. We got to talking. I got distracted. Probably started preaching. We were almost in Tennessee, y'all. And that's what happens. We get so used to it. And my prayer for you in this is that we would know the realness. I know most of us in this room, you've heard Handel's Messiah. We've, we've sang it, tried to sing it. We've seen Christmas carols. We've heard this, this scripture. He is the wonderful counsel of the prince. But I, but I want us to know, I want us to experience it. Our relationship with God is not something from a distance. It's not just something to know in our head. Today, I want us to experience the wonderful counselor himself, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the mighty God. If you just bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're comfortable doing so, just open your hands up like you're receiving from the Lord. Let's just take a moment right here and just submit our hearts to him. Lord, here we are. We surrender to you today. Lord, you know what we're carrying. Lord, you know what we need. So today we just come in this moment and we make a decision to relinquish control, to accept the help, to accept the closeness of who you are. Perhaps, Lord, you've been speaking, but now today it's, we need real peace, not just something that is fragile. You are our source. Come on, we just whisper that to him, just say that to him, Lord, you're my source. You're everything that I need. Surrender to you today. Thank you, Jesus. 
for your presence in this place. Thank you that we can feel it physically, we can experience it emotionally and spiritually. As you continue to pray with every head bowed and every eyes closed, if today you'd say, Michael, I need a relationship with Jesus. I don't know him in a personal way. If I were to breathe my last breath today, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. But today you say, I, I want to know him. I want to begin this relationship with him. Maybe you've prayed a prayer. You could be even a member of this church or a church. And you say, but I, I, I'm just not walking closely with him. And I just feel this thing happening in my heart. I, I, today, I want to get close to him. I want to recommit my life to him. We're not going to embarrass you or call you out or make you say anything. I just want to know that I'm praying for you. If you're in the house, if that's you, you just lift your hand up and put it right back down. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe you're online and you're watching. You can... You can simply just put in the comment bars, that's me. Today, I need Jesus. There's actually a place on Church Online. You can actually click and put a hand up. Say, today, I'm making Jesus the Lord of my life. I'm going to give you some words to pray right now as we commit our lives to Jesus. Just pray this in your heart. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe that everything that Isaiah said, that it is, it's true, it happened. You really are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And today, I recognize that you're my Lord and you're my Savior. I believe you came and you died on the cross. And on the third day, you rose again. And you beat death and you beat sin. So that I could have a personal relationship with you that begins right now. And then I would spend eternity with you in a place called heaven. Come, be in charge of my life. Be my Lord, be my Savior. And Holy Spirit, I invite you very presence of God to come and live alive big inside of me. Have your way. Use my life to bring you glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.